Good morning, and for those of you who just joined us to our virtual seminar about the uses of DDGs in swine diet, I'll reintroduce myself. My name is Alvaro Lopez. I am the marketing specialist for feed grains for the U.S. Grain Council and your host for today's event. For those who do not know the Grain Council, I'm going to share a short video of what we do and who we are. So um, give me a minute while we launch the video. We appreciate all of you joining us this morning. And there you got a little, a little bit of information of the US Grain Council and what we do around the world. And now I'll have a few words. We'll introduce Dr. Tanika, who will formally open today's session. Good morning, and it's great having you today. Good morning, Alvaro. Thank you for having me here today and welcome everybody. I am so excited to see you all, albeit virtually. I am sorry that we could not meet in person. I've certainly missed our face-to-face -face interactions with the farmers. You know, they they you always provide me with valuable information whenever I'm out there in the field so that we can make adjustments and just understand the needs of our swine producers. But despite the fact that we are not able to meet, that doesn't mean that we cannot exchange ideas and, and just formulate plans to move the industry forward. And with that in mind, um, the Jamaica Broilers and Hyperfeeds in conjunction with US Grains Council is pleased to welcome you all to today's session where we'll be discussing something that promises to be very informative, the use of DDGS in, in swine diets. It's something that we've done here at Hypro for numerous years. I remember 
15 years ago, dry distillers greens with solubles added back into the formulas um, was a variable ingredient. It was a wild card. Nobody knew how to, how to formulate with it. But over the years, as manufacturing processes have improved, it now is a go-to protein source in, in our feed formulations, particularly in swine diets, because pigs can really utilize this product very well, and it has some advantages. And, um, <clears throat> you know, at high pro feeds, we've always been cutting edge, and we always seek to increase our understanding of what is out there to um, ensure that the product that reaches you, the consumer, is not only the best product, but will improve your efficiency and will also improve your profitability. And, and that is the, the most important thing. If you're not making money, then we are not helping you as, as a feed manufacturer. So with that in mind, I, I want to introduce briefly our technical team that are your partners in this entire process. We have Dr. Lenworth McCullough, he's a vet in charge of swine production. We have Dr. Kirk Harris, he's a vet in charge of poultry production. Dr. Shane Mahew, he is in charge of small ruminants. Um, Dr. Michael Moto, he is the chief veterinarian at Hyperfeeds. We have Mr. Khalil Brown, he is a boots on the ground animal nutritionist. He visits the farmers, give me feedback, let me understand what is going on out there in the field. And of course, I am um, the nutritionist. I, lately, I sit mostly in the office formulating feeds, trying to negotiate with suppliers because with this global pandemic, we've, we've had tremendous increases in prices and logistic nightmare. But I'm the one that ensures that we keep the prices as low as possible without compromising your performance. Um, right now, the, the buzzword out there in the industry is pivoting. And it has nothing to do with physics. It has nothing to do with netball, the game of netball, where you pivot, pivot the ball to get to somebody else. But rather, how are we as an industry, both the feed manufacturing industry and the swine industry, going to change directions to ensure that we remain relevant? And one of the ways in which we remain relevant is keeping abreast of research that is out there, keeping abreast of best practices. And it means that sometimes not only looking inward as to what we can improve within ourselves, but outward to see what is available with the, from the rest of the world, pick and choose what is appropriate for our Jamaican situation. And then from it, ensure that we have a synergistic relationship between not just the feed, but the technical people and you, the producers, everybody working in concert with each other to ensure that we have maximum profitability and efficiency. And with that in mind, um, I, I am pleased to, to team up with um, the rest of my Hypro team to, to welcome not only the U.S. Grains Council and thank them for, for assembling these two distinguished speakers here today, and Alvaro is going to, to introduce them properly, but I'm, I'm truly humbled that we were able to, to get them here to talk to us about this very timely um, protein source, dried distillers grain with solubles, and um, I want you all to just help me welcome them, you know, and, and then of course I want to briefly show you our, our range of feed, pig feeds that's available. I know some farmers only know about our grow feed, but we have a pre-starter, a starter diet, two types of pig growers depending on your genetics, a finisher formula that has been reformulated to ensure lean, lean muscle growth. We have a gestation, and then of course we have our lactation formulas. And if you have any questions about these, uh, these different feed types, you can speak to Khalil Brown, Dr. McCullough, or myself. Um, and, you know, again, thank you all for being here and know that you're very busy people and we're truly blessed to have you with us. Alvaro? Thank you, Dr. Uh, Tanika, for those kind words and the introduction as well for the console. But before um, I introduce the speakers, I'm going to share some relevant information about the platform we'll be using today. 
So give me just one second, please. So we can. Excuse me, guys. So the first um, point about the platform today is for all the participants, please take into account that the microphones are muted as for the webinar, for the whole webinar. We'll be using two icons, which is one that says Q&A. This Q&A icon is to make the questions to the speakers or to the participants on throughout the webinar. You can write any questions about their presentations, any, any, any inquiry about feeding diets, DDGs, and this Q&A icon or this chat is specifically for the speakers, which they will be answering all the questions on the Q&A session at the end. Then we have another icon, which is a regular icon for the chat. This would be more for the housekeeping of the event just any questions, any issues you guys are having through the platform, please please feel free to write us through this chat. Then, um, then today's session will be recorded and then it will be available for all that attended and for others who did not. And at the end of the session, we'll be launching a poll, which we encourage you to please help us by filling in before you leave the session. So we can definitely improve the content that we're doing. Our webinar for today, our program is scheduled for an hour and a half. We should be ending or we should be about finishing the program about 1030. If we go a little bit beyond, I apologize in advance. And now I'm going to go back to our distinguished speakers that will be with us today. And first, we'll begin with Dr. Bob Thatter. Dr. Thatter received his bachelor degrees and master degree from South Dakota State University and his PhD in swine nutrition from Kansas State University in 1988. He returns to South Dakota as an extension swine specialist and has held a variety of positions, including assistant experiment station director, agriculture and natural resource program leader for extension, and South Dakota State University's Animal and Range Science Department head. He currently serves as an extension swine specialist and focuses on helping pork producers and students in, and students in the state and region with the responsible growth of the swine industry. He focused on production-based research and was involved with the funding of a building of a new $7 million Swine Teaching Research Extension Center for the South Dakota State University. In 2018, he received a Fulbright scholarship to work at the Vietnam National University of Agriculture in Hanoi and was named South Dakota State University Distinguished Professor in 2021. He has consulted extensively for the past 30 years with the U.S. Soybean Expert Council and the U.S. Grain Council as well in China, Southeast Asia, Central and South America, and other parts of the world. Dr. Thaler, thank you for being with us today. It's great to be able to share this time and this information, and please proceed with your presentation. So how does that look, Oliver? You're looking well, Dr. Thaw. Great, great. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. I wanna thank U.S. Grains Council, uh, Jamaican Broilers Tanika for, for giving me this opportunity. And, and while that's a re really nice introduction, I appreciate that. Basically, I, you know, I'm a farm kid. I grew up on a diversified farm, uh, graduated from college in the 1980s when there was a farm crisis ended back at South Dakota State University. And I tell people I've got the world's best job because I get to work with great producers and, and get to work with their children as well. So it's a great opportunity and, and I love doing stuff like this. So uh, with that, I'm gonna talk about, you know, some of the considerations you need to think about when deciding whether or not to use DDGS in, in swine diets. I've been married for 35 years and I know I don't know everything 
but I know where to get the information from. So uh, all the information that, that I've used in this upcoming presentation comes from a variety of sources, Dr. Rob Musser from NutriQuest, and they probably have the largest database on DDGS in the United States. Uh, Dr. Jerry Sherson from University of Minnesota and Hans Stein from University of Illinois have done a tremendous amount of research on DDGS. Uh, the Kansas State University Swine Nutrition Team is probably the best applied swine nutrition group in, in the country. Uh, and then Mr. Caleb Worth from U.S. Grains Council in Southeast Asia. And also I work with a lot of the, the production systems in Minnesota and South Dakota, got information for them. But if you, if honestly, if you want some really good information on DDGS, I encourage you to go to www.grains.org. And that is U.S. Grain Council's DDGS User Handbook. It's fourth edition. I think it was published in 2019. It is an incredible resource. It pretty much covers all the species, economics, feed manufacturing, and those things. So again, uh, in 30 minutes, we can't tell you everything. And, and that's a great resource. So a little bit about the evolution of, of DDGS and ethanol. Actually, <laughs> ethanol or alcohol has been around for a long time, probably for, for thousands of years. Uh, you know, you look at fine Jamaican rum, that, that's a version of ethanol, but it's probably not what we're going to use in, in livestock. But actually, when Henry Ford developed the Model T in 1908, it was designed to run on ethanol. But uh, oil prices were much cheaper then, and so we really didn't think much about ethanol until the 1970 when we had the oil crisis, the, the, the embargoes and those kinds of things, gas prices skyrocketed. And so people started going back and saying, hey, what about this ethanol thing using in vehicles? We started seeing more state and federal subsidies. And just to keep it in mind, so in, in 1987, uh, when a farmer would sell corn, it was worth about $58 a ton, which, which is, is very inexpensive. Uh, Poet, I think is the world's largest ethanol producer. They bought the first ethanol plant in 1987, and it was about 30, 30 miles from the family farm I grew up on. But then starting in the 1990s and early 2000s, many producer-owned ethanol plants were built. And if, if you take a look at the picture across the country, that was the way many uh, grain producers stepped up, worked together in a cooperative system to try to increase the value of the corn that they were raising. Two things happened that uh, on the federal side that really helped fuel the growth of the ethanol industry. In 2005, there was a federal renewable fuel standards. In 2007, the, the Energy Independence and Security Act. Those really helped by uh, mandating the use of ethanol in, in all products as well as subsidizing it. And so just to think about it then, so in 2013, corn selling price was $273 a ton. So a four, almost a five-fold increase in selling price for corn because not only now did it go to livestock, but it went to ethanol production. And so if you take a look at this slide, it basically shows the growth of ethanol production starting in 1981, pretty low. And again, we start at the end of the 90s, we start at seeing ramping up and in the 2000s, it just exponential growth. And 2018, 19, 20 is pretty much plateaued out, but you can see uh, a huge amount of ethanol production. And along with producing ethanol also comes uh, co-product, right? Because we, we you know, 30% of, of the product gets turned to ethanol. We got 67% of the product left to deal with. Uh, and you can see the dark blue line is going to be distiller's grain, corn gluten meal, or feed would be green, corn gluten meal, the brown one, but predominantly it's going to be DDGS. And there's a, a ton of product out there to, to, to utilize. And again, it's one of those feedstuffs that works well in, in livestock diets. But again, in the last 20 years, exponential growth in the amount of DDGS available as well. And I just want to give you a little background on it. So this would be the standard ethanol production. Actually, we call it hot fermentation. So basically the, grind, the, the corn comes into the ethanol plant, it gets finely ground, puts in a slurry tank with water. It's heated up to a, a fairly high temperature. Uh, yeast enzymes are added. And with that, you have a fermentation process going on. Uh, we, we call it beer. And then it gets distilled. And the liquid coming off is ethanol. And that gets sold for, for use. But then we have that other product. It's called whole stellage. It goes through a centrifuge. 
and you get two products. You get syrup and then you get the wet grain. The wet grain then goes into a, a drum dryer, uh, dried down to 88% to dry matter and gets sold as DDGS. The syrup has two different options. The syrup can get sold as a liquid for cattle rations, for, for cow cap operations. That works really well. If they're not moving enough that way, then this syrup will get sprayed onto the wet grain in, in the drum uh, dryer. And we'll talk about some of the consequences of, of doing that later, but that is traditional uh, hot fermentation. Uh, Poet is, is a company that uses cold fermentation and what they do instead of heating uh, the slurry right there, they have a patented group of enzymes and, and those kinds of things that they add. And so everything else is the same, except it's not heated as much. And so they, it's, it's another F or another DDGS product that comes out, uh, probably really started around 2004. Uh, the one thing that I want to talk about that's important, all DDGS is not created equal. And because the, the new thing that's happened is we see a lot of uh, almost all the eth all the DDGS in the United States is going to be reduced oil. Uh, initially, uh, it used to be 10, 11% oil, but now corn oil has such a high value that most ethanol plants have put a centrifuge on. They centrifuge the syrup, pull off the corn oil, and and sell that separately. So instead of having 10 to 11% oil. Today's DGS will be anywhere from four to, to nine percent, and, and you need to visit with the supplier about that because that makes a huge difference nutritionally and economically. Okay, so uh, and again, this just kind of shows it. So starting about 2009, 2010, uh, again, a lot more centrifuges are pulled on and and pulling a lot of oil out of that DDGS. Okay, and this is a, a, a summary slide looking at the percentage of ethanol plants in each state uh, that have reduced oils. So if you take a look at 2011, this green bar represents basically no removing of oil, and that was about 60% of the plants. The, the red line would be those that DDGS was less than 7% oil. And as you can see, as we go to 12, 13, 14, up to 17, a pretty dramatic change. So. Uh, about 35, almost 40% of the plants at that time were less than 7% oil and, and probably only 5%. And this is going to continue to grow. So what you're seeing when you're looking at fat content, and fat means energy, uh, that's been decreasing, okay, because uh, they've, they've taken that corn oil out, okay. Uh, and again, this was uh, uh, a summary slide from U.S. Grains Council in Land Lakes. Basically, and this was probably in about 2019, only five out of the 60 ethanol plants had greater than 9% oil. If you look at the fat content here, and actually I, I would bet today that that might be one, because again, there's just too much money to be made on the oil side. And especially as you look at uh, the demand for uh, renewable biodiesel, okay? And so the other thing that's interesting to watch is, is how the whole industry has evolved. <clears throat> And basically from when it started in 1987, so probably about the year of 2000, uh, most of those plants looked at DDGS as a byproduct. They were making a bunch of money on the ethanol, that DDGS was a byproduct they just had to get rid of. And, and, and quality, to be quite honest, wasn't that good. They were getting rid of it, they were selling it to cattle or selling it to pigs, and uh, they really didn't have to worry about quality. However, starting in the year 2000, once ethanol uh, production really started ramping up, that meant there was a tons of DDGS you had to get rid of. And so now, instead of a byproduct, it became a co-product, something that had equal value that to sell, and there was enough competition between plants, people, producers knew that they had to have a qu high quality DDGS product if they were gonna move it. So really around 2000 is when we started seeing the enhancement, the improvement in quality, in, in DDGS, okay? So if, if you've ever attended any of the, the U.S. Grain Council's DDGS seminars, I'm sure you've seen this famous slide from, from Jerry Sherson, and that just talked about the variability in, in DDGS in those early years that we used to see. However, when we look at DDGS today, we're gonna see it's a much more consistent product. 
One of the things is there's less variation within plants, okay? Uh, basically, it's a, it was a new technology in the, in the late 80s. We've got the, that figured out. There's more consistency within the plant. There's much more control and ingredients uh, bringing in as well as processing. There's much tighter controls on the type of corn that comes in as well as how they process that corn. And what we see then, and I'll show you some data in a little bit, that the DDGS coming out has much higher nutrient levels as well as digestibilities. And then it's a much more mature industry. So again, you know, ethanol industry has been going strong for about 35 years. And anytime you start something new, there's, there's growing pains. And that's what you saw in the ethanol industry. That's why there was so much variation. But now 35 years later, They've got that technology down and it's a, it's a very consistent product. And again, I'm sure if, if you looked at when soybean meal was first made, you saw that same type of variability. Once they got the technology down, it became a consistent product. And today's DDGS is a very consistent product. Okay. One of the things that's changed, we talked about increase in nutrient uh, content is change in lysine. So if you look uh, some data from 2004, 2005, average DDGS had 0.78% lysine. In 2009 to 2012, that increased to 0.93. Uh, by 2015, 16, it was almost 1% total lysine in the diet. And from 2004, that is a 27% increase in lysine. And you're gonna say, well, how in the world did that happen? Corn did not really increase in the percent lysine. So what, you know, what magic happened there? Well, what happened is we started pulling oil out of the corn, okay? And so, so basically, initially, when we had DDGS, you would say whatever nutrient was in the corn, you took it times three, and that's what would be in DDGS, because that was the basically replacing the starch that you pulled out. So as you pull out more things like oil, the remaining things increase in percentage. So as they pulled out oil, we saw lysine increase. And again, lysine is the first limiting amino acid in swine diets. So just in, you know, in a span of, of 10 to 15 years, we saw a 27% increase in the most essential amino acid for pigs. Not only uh, was it an increase in the amount of lysine, but the digestibility increased because really that's what pigs and poultry require. It's not total amino acids, it's available amino acids. And so as we look here, uh, the blue bar is 2009, the, the red bar is 2017. So protein digestibility increased by 7%, lysine increased by almost 6% digestibility, methionine, threonine, tryptophan, all improved. And that gets back to how we process it. Instead of overheating it and, and, and causing some, some unavailability there, they've, they've taken much more care during that processing during the drying so not only is there more lysine, more of the essential amino acid in today's DDGS, but those amino acids are much more available, which means more money in your pocket. Okay, uh, these are some of the first slides that came out talking about color, right? You know, we talked about the gold standard, gold DDGS is, is good, brown DDGS is bad. And, and this is some of the data that, that showed that. So L star would be lightness. So you can see sample one is light, sample two is, is less light, sample three is that same way, same thing with red. And so when they looked at total lysine, one and two pretty, were pretty similar, but sample three, the, the brown sample had very low lysine. And that was because of the Maillard reaction or the Browning reaction. You overheat it, that lysine becomes bound with carbohydrates and not available. You look at digestibility and you can see as it got darker, uh, it was less digestible. And actually this was done by Amy Batal in 2017 on the poultry side. So again, we're talking 14, 14 years ago, but today things are different. Today, when you look at buying DDGS, color is not an accurate indicator of nutritional value. Okay, and I think another way to look at that is uh, a really good way is if you look at the lysine to crude protein ratio, if it's greater than 3.4%, it's a really good DDGS for poultry, swine, and aquaculture. But I cannot stress enough today, uh, their uh, color is not a really good way to, to value DDGS. And, and here's some data from, from 2018. 
using a sequenced rooster assay, looking at the relationship, the correlation between amino acid digestibility and color. And if you look at that, it's only 0.16. So really, color only explained about 2.6% of the variability in amino acid digestibility. So again, in the early years, when there wasn't as much quality control on, on making DDGS, color was a good, good way to do it. But in today's DDGS, today's ethanol plant, there is much more quality control. Color is not a good indicator of DDGS quality. And this just goes to support that. Recently, here were uh, three different types of DDGS. You can see, you know, kind of a tan brown, darker brown. Color obviously changes. But when you look at amino acid digestibility, actually the darker colors have higher digestibility. And the reason why is why is it dark? It is a darker brown, not because it was overheated. It's a darker brown because that excess syrup was added back on. So this DDGS was not burnt. It was just, it's more brown. It's a darker color because more syrup was added and it's, it's actually a really good product. So what about quality standards? You know, if, if there's, there's national standards for corn, for wheat, those types of things, we really don't have any official quality standards for DDGS. Uh, you know, they, uh, some of the grain traders are gonna use the, the 36 Pro Fat to, as a way at least to try to standardize it. And basically all that is, is taking the percent protein plus the percent fat. And if it's 36% or greater, it's a good product. So you can say we got 28% protein DDGS, 8% fat, that gives us 36. That's a good product, okay? Really easy to do, even I can do that, right? But it is a very poor indicator of the real economic value of DDGS. And especially today, as we look at reduced oil DDGS, it is not a realistic way to value DDGS. So if there's 5% oil in DDGS, that DDGS would need to be 31% protein to get there. And so with today's reduced oil DDGS, 36 pro fat is a bad way to look at valuing it, okay? So again, how do we value it? We, it's gonna be, you know, we talk about DDGS providing amino acids. It certainly does that, but it provides energy, it provides other digestible amino acids beside lysine and provides available phosphorus. It's got this whole nutrient profile that it provides and each component has an economic value. Profat doesn't provide any of this. And uh, again, there we do deal with some variations in nutrient levels and digestibility between plants. So we have to be careful about how we value that. Okay. And again, you know, I've, I've worked in a lot of different countries for the U.S. Grains Council and, and, the, and the interesting conversation is always between the grain buyers and the nutritionists. And, and Tanika and Khalil, I'm, I'm sure you face that too, right? You know, the grain buyers, they want to get the product as inexpensive as possible. And nutritionists, we want a high quality product that we can deal with. So it depends who you ask, how it's valued. So when you look at DDGS, again, it's a protein source, it's an, it's an amino acid source, but it also provides energy. There's oil, there's starch, there's fiber that's digestible that produces energy. Even though there's less oil, there's still five to eight and a half, nine percent oil in it. Uh, certainly all the amino acids are in there. And what's becoming more and more uh, expensive is phosphorus. And the phosphorus in DDGS is highly available, much more available than what you'll see in, in uh, soybean meal, okay? So by strictly buying on crude protein and crude fat usually undervalues the DDGS by 40 to $100 metric ton. And so I just wanna go through an example uh, that the US Grains Council used a few years ago. And so you're taking a look here at five different types of commercially available DDGS. So we look at protein ranging from 25.7 uh, to 29%, fat from 5.7 to 8.7, uh, lysine is from 0.82 to 0.92, phosphorus is from 0.8 to, to 0.93. So looking at those, which one would you say is worth the most? Okay, which DDGS sample has the highest value or are they all the same? And so what they went ahead and did is using shadow pricing, they use least cost formulation 
So not only for protein or not only lysine did they give it an economic value, they gave it values for all the digestible amino acids, for metabolizable energy, for phosphorus, for all the other minerals that came in, an economic value was assigned to it. And so what's really interesting at that time, the spot price for DDGS was $182 a ton, okay? And with that, if you were just buying it, that's what you got it for. The true value of that DDGS ranged from, let me see here, uh, 219 all the way up to 279 values when you put a price on each nutrient. So you can see the performance value gain was all the way from $37 a ton up to almost $100 a ton based on nutrients. And so again, that's how we want people to value it, not just say fat and, and, and oil, but what does each of those uh, individual nutrients cost or worth? And that is that makes a huge difference. So again, obtain the nutrient profile and digestibility coefficients along with the price. And then in your least cost ration formulation, put a shadow price in and, and see what it looks like. And I think you're gonna be really pleasantly surprised. And again, if the company can't provide you that, uh, get a representative sample to a third lab and, and go from there. Okay, so when you're looking at buy-in, uh, uh, DDGS, some of the things certainly you wanna consider is moisture, uh, both from a flowability standpoint and mycotoxins. And, and Tanika, you were talking about how, how it's 70 degrees at night and 80 in, in the afternoon, that, that's a really great place to be. Uh, but when it's warm like that, you do worry about mycotoxins. So you wanna make sure that it's not too wet. Obviously, you wanna have a guarantee for protein, fat in there, uh, some considerations about fiber. Mycotoxins for anything, any feed stuff that shipped is a concern. You may want to use L-Star, less than 50 in particle size, but understanding each one of those things you put in a contract has an economic price to it. So uh, just things to think about when, when doing it. And again, what I talk to our producers about or, or anybody about buying DDGS, find one supplier, find an ethanol plant or a, a company that provides a consistent product that you can work with and it's high quality and, and keep dealing with them. Uh, you know, you can, a nutritionist can deal with a product as long as it's consistent. And that's why I really encourage you to find an ethanol company, ethanol plant that sells uh, a consistent DDGS that, that you can work with. Okay, so uh, talking about nutritional a little bit more. So this is a 2012 NRC. And, and I pulled that up and it looks like, it looks at the nutrient requirements of swine all the way from five kilograms out to about 130, 35. And it look, takes a look at net energy, metabolizable energy, calcium, phosphorus, all the amino acids are in there, right? And that, that's kind of the gold standard for us. The one question I have in you, where does it say that pigs require corn and soybean meal? You know, we, in the United States, we, we get to be lazy nutritionists because corn and soybeans meal so cheap. And that becomes the mindset, well, it's not as good as corn and soybean meal. The things that you have to re understand, and I'm sure you do, is pigs don't require corn and soybean meal. They require nutrients. So much, so many grams of lysine, so many grams of calcium, so many international units of vitamin E, right? They require nutrients. And DDGS is just one way to provide those nutrients. It's a great source. It's different than soybean meal. Doesn't make it better or worse. It's just different. And so we have to put a value on the nutrients that it provides. So DDGS, again, in, in swine diets, it's not a protein source. It provides energy, amino acids, and phosphorus, okay? Uh, and basically the inclusion level that you're gonna uh, use depends on those values. Okay, if you use net energy, available amino acids and available phosphorus, you're gonna be able to put DDGS in a much higher inclusion rate, okay? And again, if you want energy values uh, and digestible amino acid values, those equations are in that DDGS handbook. Again, an excellent resource to, to get. But the thing I always ask producers for, you know, we, we raise livestock because we like to raise livestock, right? But at the end of the day, we've got to get We've got to make money on it. And so all these different things, as they affect pigs, as they affect the level of production, what do we get paid on when we sell our pigs? Okay. So as, if you look at the National Swine Nutrition Guide from 2010, here are the recommendations for the upper limit 
of DDGS in different phases. So in the nursery phase, 10% DDGS. Uh, in, in the early grower, 20%. Uh, next phase, 30%. The finishing phase, 20%. Gestation, 40% DDGS and, and farrow weaning, 20 And again, remember this was from 2010, which means the data probably came from 2009 or earlier. Uh, and again, not much reduced oil DDGS in, in 2010. And this recommendation is strictly based off that 20% maximum late finishing due to soft bellies. And that's a concern to everybody because bellies are where bacon come from. So we don't wanna do anything that messes that up. But this 20% was done with high oil DDGS, DDGS that contained 10 to 11% fat. And so these values, recommendations are not applicable with today's reduced oil DDGS, okay? And again, anytime you try a new feed stop, what I recommend to people is that you don't add 40% right away. You start with the lower inclusion level, increase that as the animals get used to it, and, and you're gonna be happy with the performance. Feed use by phase, this is something that I use all the time when making nutritional decisions. We have our different phases over here, and right this column, is how much kilograms of feed per phase do they eat? And then what's the percent to of the total feed use in that operation? And where is that important is where we decide to use DDGS, where we decide to use any product, right? So if we can use, if we can add DDGS to the grow finish, we're impacting 75% of the feed that goes through that operation. So if we can add 5% more DDGS or 10% more DDGS, lower the cost, in this grow finish phase, we've just lowered the cost in 75% of the feed that goes through that operation. Also, grow finish phase is where there's least amount of risk. The other thing we encourage people to do, and many of our producers are going to use high levels of DDGS and gestation, because again, uh, we limit energy intake there, feed intake, it works well. So if you just target DDGS use in grow, finish, and gestation, that's going to be 86% of the feed that goes through that operation with very little risk and a lot of potential reward in reducing uh, diet cost. Okay, so how much, how much DDGS can you use? And I rely on, on Dr. Gary Ali, who was my mentor, unfortunately passed away way too early. And it's watch the pig, they'll, they'll tell you the answer. And it just comes down to risk reward. Okay, and so what we, what we recommend is start with a lower level and increase it until performance changes. And the interesting thing, it's gonna be different for different operations. So again, understand that the pig will tell you, if we're, if we're smart enough to watch the pig, the pig is gonna tell you when you have too much of anything. And so again, I think you'll be surprised how much DDGS you can add to a diet without affecting pig performance. Uh, this is some stuff that we did in, in 2019 here. It's, we've got it submitted for publication. We looked at 0, 20, 40, 60% DDGS and, and pig diets from 20 to 122 kilograms. You look at average daily gain, it was not affected. Feed intake was not affected. Feed efficiency wasn't affected. So we could literally feed 60% DDGS, not affect pig's growth performance. However, when we looked at carcasses, because that's part of the thing we sell, right? Hot carcass weight didn't change. Dressing percent was a little bit lower. We'll talk about that. Fat thickness, loin depth did not change. Percent lean did not change. Belly iodine value, which is an indication of unsaturation, did increase as we expected it would. You're adding more DDGS, you're adding more corn oil, which is unsaturated. So we saw that increase and belly flop score, which is indication of, of unsaturation of the bellies, that also decreased. So those two components, it, it did impact. So what is belly flop score? So basically we freeze our bellies and we just put them on a measure on, on, a, on a rod and, and see if they do this or if they stay straight, okay? And that angle is what we measure. So uh, we look at that 20% DDGS limit and again, it was strictly due to soft bellies. All the research showed in those early years that we could feed up to 20% DDGS and, and have bellies that look like this, okay? If we went to the 30%, uh, then, then it became an issue, okay? Packers are understand that. They want the iodine value less than 72, 
But my question to everybody is how much reduced oil DDGS can you add and still keep that iodine value around 72? And just to help you think about this, so again, the early stuff, uh, oil, DDGS was 10%, 11% oil, take that times 20%. That means we're adding 2.2% oil and, and bellies were fine. And I think Tanika, when we were visiting, you said that your DDGS is between eight and eight and a half percent oil. So if it's 8% oil, we can increase that to 27 and a half percent DDGS, get the same amount of oil, or if it's 8.5, almost 26% and get the same amount. So understanding it's not the DDGS, it's the oil that we worry about with soft bellies. And again, with today's reduced oil DDGS, you can go to higher levels without that problem. Uh, and here's some data that kind of supports that. We're looking at no uh, uh, DDGS, uh, a low fat DDGS, and a high fat DDGS at 20 and 40%. And you can see at, at 20%, it's still low. At 40%, it's a little bit above 72. So with this low fat uh, DDGS, you could probably feed 30% and still be certainly less than 72. If you've got that high fat DDGS, you probably hit 25% to get to that 72 uh, belly fat iodine value. Okay, so maximizing DDGS levels while maintaining belly fat quality. Certainly one of the things that you can do is formulate your diets on iodine value. Uh, that works out pretty well. And again, most people are gonna use DDGS with low uh, fat levels. Uh, the other thing you can do from, from a production standpoint, again, most people wanna make sure, and I know uh, in, in Jamaica, the bellies uh, are our main concern. So we wanna make sure those are good quality. So one thing that you do, their fat turns over about every three weeks. So the, the final three weeks before harvest, before slaughter, you can reduce the number, you can re reduce or pull out DDGS those last three weeks, and then those bellies are gonna firm up very nicely. So I know uh, looking at, at your, your slide there, Tanika, it looked like you have uh, two, uh, a grower and a finishing phase. If you wanna add a third phase, that would just be for the last three weeks and either pull out or reduce the amount of DDGS in there, belly, belly quality is gonna be really good. The other thing that you could do, and we, we have visited about this before as well, lipinate is a, a feed additive that you can add that actually uh, firms up the bellies. It's accompanied by NutriQuest. And, and if you look at that right now, uh, you could save about seven to $8 a pig by going to higher levels of DDGS and adding lipinate back, and you're gonna have the same good belly quality, okay? Uh, a lot of your feed is pelleted. And so I went to some Kansas State research done in 2013, where they looked at pelleting a corn soybean meal diet versus a corn soybean meal 30% DDGS diet. So we look at the standard pellet durability index. They're identical, they're statistically the same. Modified pellet durability index, the same. Actually fewer fines with 30%. Uh, with uh, production rate, kilograms uh, pelleted per hour were the same. The exit temperature was the same. So when you look at that, this data at Kansas State showed that you can pellet up to 30% DDGS and not have a problem with pellet quality. But I've worked with uh, my friend, Dr. Kim Cope from the Northern Crops Institute long enough to understand that pelleting is an art. And there's a lot of things that, that go in there. So, uh, you know, he was, he's my go-to reference and we've traveled a lot for, for Grains Council together. So if you have questions on pelleting, when you go to higher levels of DDGS, Kim would be a great place. I'm sure Alvaro and, and other people there have, have good references as well. So other things that are gonna impact you when you use DDGS, your dressing percent will go lower because with that higher fiber diet, you're gonna have more intestinal mass. If you don't get docked for that, then it's not a problem. The other thing that comes into play with higher levels of DDGS, we're gonna to need to add more synthetic tryptophan. But again, typically it's, it's cheap enough. We can make a lot of money going to higher levels, just adding some synthetic tryptophan back. One thing that a, a lot of our, our large uh, pork production systems in the United States will do uh, are concerned about flowability of DDGS through the feed mill. And they've, uh, companies I work with, they've identified some of the ethanol plants that have a good product that it flows well through the feed mill. It doesn't, doesn't bridge up in bulk bins and those kinds of things. They will pay an additional $10 a ton 
just for what that means for them going through their feed mill. And so again, I really encourage you to take a look at DGGS, start, you know, you, you're already feeding some now, you know, it works, start increasing that. And I think the more and more you'll do that, you're gonna gain confidence in, in how it works in, in your system. Uh, mycotoxins, again, we always worry about that. And it's dependent on the mycotoxin content, content of the corn. And again, if you look where the ethanol plants are, they're in the corn belt. And, and typically, uh, mycotoxins aren't gonna be a problem in the corn belt. You know, aflatoxins are gonna be down here, much too, much too cold, unfortunately, uh, for us to hear. You know, we're gonna have four to five months uh, that are gonna be below freezing. And so when that happens, you don't have mycotoxin growth. So five months below freezing. So again, we, we can have years, we can have pockets where mycotoxins are a problem and we just need to make sure we, we test for that. So in general, uh, you can feel fairly confident that mycotoxins are not gonna be issue in, in DDGS coming from the corn belt. So in summary, you know, DDGS composition and, and, and quality have changed and they're gonna continue to evolve. We're gonna see more fractionization of comp, uh, components coming out of there as technology allows that. But again, I cannot stress enough, DDGS is an excellent source of nutrients. That being of energy, available amino acids, available phosphorus for livestock. And again, today's DDGS is a much higher and more consistent uh, quality product than what we dealt with 20 years ago. And again, color is not a good indicator of DDGS quality. And again, DDGS value is affected by many diff different factors as we've seen. And again, it differs by system and country. And, and Tanika, you made a great point right at the beginning. We need to learn from each other and what works in one place may not work in another, but, but it may. And so understanding those differences are important. Pro-fat, don't use it. That's a terrible way to value, to price DDGS. Use your least cost ration formulization to, to do that. And again, with today's reduced D, uh, DDGS, you can easily go to at least 25% in a finishing diet without affecting growth rate, without affecting carcass performance, and without affecting milling efficiency. So again, uh, there's, there's a lot of money to be saved using higher levels of DDGS and with the competitiveness of the pork industry, you cannot afford not to try using higher levels of DDGS in your swine diets. And again, just start off with, with your current level, start increasing that to find the point where, where it doesn't work. But I think you're gonna be very pleasantly surprised how much more you can add, how, much, how many dollars you're gonna be saving your producers and without uh, impacting performance at all. So, Alvaro, that's all I have, and I, and I thank you all for your, for your attention. Dr. Thatter, thank you for that presentation. We definitely received a couple of questions on the chat, which we'll be addressing at the Q&A session after Bob Hemisad's presentation. And now I'll be introducing Bob in a minute. So Bob Hemisat serves as a member of the Corn Board of the National Growers Association, a farmer-led trade association with offices in St. Louis and Washington, DC. Mr. Hemisat currently farms 3,000 acres of corn and runs 40,000 head hog wean to finish and feeder to finish along with his family. Bob also chairs the governance committee serves as corn board liaison for the National Pork Producer Council and chairs the NCGAS Market Development Committee. Previously, he served as the chair of the Feed, Food and Industrial Action Team and the Trade Policy for Biotechnology Action Team at the national level. In addition, Mr. Hemisath has served as chairman of the Iowa Corn Growers Association and secretary of the county extension councils at a state level. Bob. Thank you, thank you for being with us this morning, and please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Alvaro. Uh, all right, can you see that? Yep, we got to put it on presentation mode and you're good to go. Okay. All right, well, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, visit with you today. I appreciate the opportunity from the Grains Council. Um, looking forward to our discussion later. Um, 
Bob, just one, one, one note. Can you put it on presentation? All right. Um, Bob, if you go to slideshow, slideshow, at, um, no, no, slideshow. In the title. Oh, here we go. Yep. Okay. All right. And then click on from beginning. The it's the icon in the very left from beginning. Okay. Here you go. Thank you, Dr. Tika. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right. Uh good morning. As I said, I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today. And uh, uh as a fellow pork producer, look forward to uh uh, possibly uh, answering some of your questions and sharing some uh, uh, information back and forth as to how we can make uh, uh, DDGs work uh, better in your operations. So I uh, farm in Northeast Iowa uh, near Town Decora, farm with my brother and uh, nephew, um, fifth generation farmer. Um, we raise corn and have weed and finish hog operation. Um, we farm about 2,900 acres. Um, average yield is 220 bushels to the acre. Um, we, uh, the Iowa average is 198 in 2019. Uh, U.S. average is 167. We're, we're, uh, we're very blessed in the Midwest to have very good soils that, uh, corn and, uh, is a very good crop to raise and it does very well in, a, in our, in our area. Um, the planning and marketing of our crop, uh, we have a local ethanol plant that's uh, uh, about 25 miles away, um, which is a uh, uh, very good opportunity for us to market our corn. It has helped, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Thaler talked about earlier, the, uh, as we continue to grow more corn, um, we needed to find ways to use it, and, and that was... Uh, uh, where ethanol started to become a big part of the uh, equation for corn. As we grew more, we needed new opportunities and ethanol has provided that. And DDGs as a co-product has become a very uh, essential part of, of the uh, uh, ethanol process and the uh, profit of the ethanol plants. It's become one of their uh, main profit drivers. So we um, also sell some corn to a Bungie terminal that uh, gets exported. Um, we've planted all corn in, in since probably 2015. Um, we have a lot of manure that we utilize from our hog operation that works well in, in our uh, uh, corn on corn rotation. Um, so this is just a, a quick slide to show kind of where U.S. corn usage goes. I won't go into it too much, but there's a, a lot of livestock that's used, but also the as you look at the exports, part of it is, is a major key to us, and DDGs falls into that. And Iowa corn usage is, is a little bit different because of most of the ethanol production is in the United States. Um, so that's, uh, uh, that's one difference there, but along with that, uh, Ethanol production is we have the availability of DDGs uh, here uh, for use in our swine operations or livestock operations, as well as for export. Um, we use a lot of technology on the farm. Uh, there's a, we use biotechnology in our, in our crops for uh, pest control, weed control. Um, use a lot of precision agriculture to uh, make sure that we're putting the fertilizer and the chemicals in the right place at the right time. So uh, a little bit about our hog operation, as we as uh, mentioned in the bio, um, we uh, we need to finish forty thousand hogs per year. Um, we utilize the manure as nutrients for the crop, and we use our own corn to feed those hogs. And we utilize DDGs from the ethanol plant. Um, the, uh, DDG, uh, the hogs go to the Tyson facility in Waterloo, Iowa, which is about 60 miles from us. So um, it's been a, been a very good uh, uh, 
economic development for us as a farm to, uh, to continue to raise hogs. Uh, we used to farrow, but uh, we decided to specialize more in the, in the wean to finish area. So we utilize uh, DDS and our rations um, as Dr. Fowler talked about the, uh, it, uh, sorry, moved ahead one. Uh, we utilize DDGs and the rations are formula formulated using nutrient requirements based on the genetics, daily feed intake and the requirements uh, of the pig. Um, we utilize up to eight different rations for the pig. And, and I'm talking from a wean to finish standpoint. Um, so there's uh, a breakdown from pre-starter to starter to the uh, go finish stage. And, and there's a roughly eight different rations that we use in there. We're currently using 10 to 20% DDGS inclusion rate. Um, we have gone up to 30% inclusion rate for quite a long period of time. Um, and that will, will depend on economics. Um, the economics are, are what drives whether we use more soybean meal, more corn, more DDGS, um, more synthetic uh, amino acids and those kind of things. But the one thing that we have noticed over the probably 15 years that we have used DDGS I'm sorry. Um, keep moving my mouse too much. Sorry about that. Uh, we have noticed improved growth, excellent meat quality, and overall success with DDGS in our rations. We've also um, we can't we can't substantiate this, and I don't believe there's a lot of research that shows it. But we, there are there are issues with uh, with uh, digestive health in in pigs, and and we believe. Like I said, we can't prove that, but we believe that DGS has somewhat of a positive impact on that, that we have less problems with that. And, and there are others that have said that, but uh, um, there's not a lot of proof in that, or not a lot of uh, data that shows that. So that's just one of the things that we feel in our operation has uh, less issues with. This is just a, uh, I apologize for all the numbers on here, but this is just uh, one of the, uh, uh, current rations that we're using on our farm and um, this kind of breaks down where we're at from a uh, soybean meal corn distillers and as you can see we're uh, at the grow finish one at 50 to 80 pound pig we're looking at uh, 200 pounds of distillers grains um, and then we go up to 400 pound inclusion rate and then as Dr. Thaler talked about on the, when we get towards the end, we back it off and we don't take it completely out, but we do back it off because of some of the concerns from a uh, uh, carcass quality standpoint. So there's just a, a, an idea of what we are currently doing. So I had a slide in here that I took out because I, it was a, uh, it was a economics of corn for 2021. And as we move into 2022, um, there's a lot of variability uh, in prices. There's a lot of variability in fertilizer. Fertilizer has doubled or if not more in, uh, for example, nitrogen prices have basically quadrupled from, from a year ago at this time. Um, so there may be some crop rotation differences um, coming into 2022. The market will dictate that. The market will decide if there is uh, the uh, uh, if there'll be more corn or soybeans in the Midwest, um, and there will be. It will be interesting to see how that plays out. I guess the point I'm making with that is that there will still always be. Uh, the market will drive enough, there's enough demand for, for corn and DDGS that the mar or, and ethanol that the market will provide enough acres to make sure that we always have enough to provide uh, a consistent source for export of DDGs, ethanol or corn or any of those, uh, anything above that. And the DDS price um, is, more, is more influenced by the price of corn. Um, 
and possibly the price of ethanol, but mainly by the price of corn. And so that's kind of where uh, it varies from time to time on how much we decide to put in our ration. Um, just some pictures of some of the conservation practices that we do where we uh, um, hill tile for drainage, uh, terracing for uh, soil conservation, you know, buffer strips, grass waterways, um, cover crops, all those kind of things are some of the things that we use to make sure that we're doing things in a sustainable manner. And in, in our, in the area I live in, we're in somewhat of a rolling topography, very good deep soils, um, but uh, also uh, need to, need extra care to make sure that we're preserving the soil for next generations. Um, just kind of wanted to touch on some of the uh, uh, things that exports provide value to farmers and, and, and the, and we have been, as I mentioned earlier, we have the opportunity here with the soils that we have to produce more than what we need in this country. And that is one of the things why we we value the relationship of the U.S. Grain Council and, and USMEF to, and, and the kind of things that we deal with here and, and conversations we're having with you today to make sure that we are supporting markets, building new markets, and also providing opportunities for um, uh, exports of our products and making sure that the end users, such as yourselves, have the ability to utilize them in the best way possible. With that, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. Uh, looking forward to the uh, relationship and the question and answer to to understand your needs better and to possibly help you utilize DGS more in your operations. Alvaro, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Bob. That was a interesting presentation, definitely. Uh, looking at the ratios that you guys are using on DDGs, it does seem a very um, good ingredient and it seems that it's a profitable ingredient for for a hog or for a U.S. hog producer at this time. Um, taking now after this presentation, we'll definitely then go directly to our Q&A session where I have the first question, which goes like this. This remember for the Q&A, um, all the um, speakers and uh, nutritionists that are online, please uh, feel free to help one another or just uh, answer the question. There's no, unless I say a name, it's directly basically to all who are with us today. So the first question is, what is the value of DDGs relative to soybean meal? You know, I'll, I'll take a first stab at that, you know, and I will, uh... I will paraphrase the answer all my engineering friends give me, and that is, it depends, right? <laughs> uh, because and because really, what you're doing anytime you buy, you buy or you're using a feed stuff, you're buying a whole package of nutrients. And you know, when, when you talk about soybean meal and, and DD just your your first inclination is, well, geez, you know, soybean meal is is 48% protein, DDGS is is 30% protein. They're you know, they're, they're different in price that way. Uh, that's part of the deal, but they provide so many more nutrients. So the best way to look at that difference is the nutrients that you're getting in, right? You know, so what, how many dollars worth of nutrients am I getting from, you know, 100 kilograms of soybean meal versus how many uh, dollars of nutrients am I getting from 100 kilograms of DDGS? And, and that's what you need to, to really value it on. Yeah, I, I agree, Bob, because one of the things, you know, as soon as we get our DDGs at the feed mill, we immediately do a near infrared spectrometer scan on it, where we get the digestible amino acid profile, we get the phosphorus levels, energy, every single thing, even down to digestible sugars. And once I enter it into my feed formulation software and just allow it to do a least cost formulation based on the nutrient parameters I've given it, uh, if I don't restrict it, um, it, it will 
it will not only replace the soybean meal, some of the soybean meal, but it will also replace corn. So that's the, the beauty of DDGS is it's not just a protein source, as you mentioned. When my phosphorus levels, especially now, phosphorus levels are really high, it acts as a, a partial replacement for our, our phosphate and it acts as a partial replacement for the corn as well as the soybean meal. And now that we've, we've started using the synthetic tryptophan, it, it certainly has improved the nutritive um, value of, of the DDGs relative to those two other ingredients. Okay, great. Thank you both for that um, full answer. Then I'll continue with the, on the same line of questioning. What is it meant by the term dig uh, digestibility? And how does this affect my pig? Yeah, and so and so really, uh, all digestibility means is that portion of protein or the portion of amino acids or the portion of phosphorus that actually gets absorbed across the small intestine into the blood that goes out to the body so it can be used. Okay, so the higher digestibility that means more of the nutrients that the animals can utilize. If it's not digestible it ends up out in, in the urine and the feces and, and they don't get any, any good out of it. So, you know, when you, when you talk about total amino acids, that, that's a nice thing to talk about, but it really doesn't mean anything to the animal. All the animal cares about is what percent of those amino acids or nutrient can they actually utilize for growth or production or, or milk and stuff like that. So really uh, all digestibility tells you is the amount of nutrients that the animal can use. The, the higher the number, the more nutrients they get in and the more value that product has. Yeah, I agree. And, and that's one of the reasons why I try to um, enforce the notion that we should move away from crude protein. You know, as you said, Bob, the, the animal doesn't have a crude protein requirement. And that's the reason why profat doesn't mean anything. The animal has a digestible amino acid requirement. I, you know, you, you can give the example of gelatin, gelatin, very high in protein, but cannot be utilized by, by the body effectively. And it's the same thing here where, you know, people would tout, oh, this product has a higher crude protein. Okay. But how much of that crude protein can actually be utilized by the animal? And that's why it's very important um, as a nutritionist, we, we formulate on digestible amino acids and, and metabolizable energy or even net energy, which is a little bit more precise way of, of formulating diets. Great. Thank you both. Now um, I'll continue with that same line and then we'll start um, adding other questions. Why, would, why should I care about the total lysine in DDGs? I think, you know, the, the total, so what you do, you take the total lysine times the digestibility factor, and then that gives you the amount of digestible amino acids. So that's, that's why you need to, to worry about total is because it's the first step. You take total times di percent digestibility, and then that'll tell you the percent that's available that the animal can actually use. Perfect. Now, um, on this fourth question, which is on, is there a significant difference nutritionally between dry or wet DDGs? Uh, dry DDGs are the ones that we receive for the export market because of the transit and everything that's involved in the, in the chain and the transportation of the ingredient. But interesting to, to see what, um, what Bob Hemisath uses in the US and what is the difference by your experience, Dr. Thatter? You know, really, and, and what it comes down to is in the United States, you know, 99.9% .9 of our, our swine feed is dry. You know, very, there's very little liquid feeding. The, the wet DDGS or the modified DDGS strictly goes to, to, to feedlot cattle. It goes to the dairy industry where it's used really well because they, they can utilize it. And, and typically that reduces the drying cost a little bit, but those are going to go to beef feedlots, dairies that are relatively close to the ethanol plant and, and the cattle can use it well because they use a, a lot of wet feeds like silage. Bob, in your operation? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're strictly dry feed operations. So, 
So the, the wet distillers is, is not an option. And our local ethanol plant that uh, uh, they used to produce a fair amount of wet DDGS. And they actually, I don't even think they produce any anymore because they, they dry it all either for export or for there's a lot of swine use around here. Now I know of some areas in the state where there's a lot of cattle that are fed, maybe out in Northwest Iowa, uh, there's some methanol plants out there that uh, utilize a lot of wet distillers. But as Dr. Thaler said, there's, there's just very little liquid feed. So it's not even considered an option for, for swine diets. And, and when you look at nutritional content, it's it's exactly the same. I mean, you know, it's DDGS with water not taken out. So, so since there's going to be a higher percentage of moisture in there, the the, the protein is going to be lower, the phosphorus is going to be lower, everything else is lower. But uh, shelf life becomes a big issue. I know our, our cattle feeders in South Dakota, especially in the summertime, you can't have that wet distillers are on more than a couple of weeks before it starts to go bad. So. You know, it's it's something fed locally. I would I would never hope it gets uh, shipped internationally, because you're shipping a lot of water that that doesn't do much good. Excellent. Thank you both. Now our, our fifth question: Are DDGs used in most pig diets in the U.S. and other countries like China? It, it all comes down to economics, and and we will see that very so much in the United States, especially with the the craziness of corn and and soybean meal and DDGS prices in the last two years. It'll go from really high inclusion rates to six months later, very little. And again, and that and, and why that's important, Alvaro, is that's that story. You're not buying feedstuffs; you're buying nutrients. And so today. My cheapest lysine available phosphorus is going to come from DDGS. And all of a sudden, something changes. And three weeks later, now uh, soybean meal and, and dical is going to be my cheapest. So it really depends on economics when it happens. China certainly is going to use a boatload of DDGS. Uh, and actually, like Vietnam, I believe they're like top three importers of DDGS. So uh, you, you see a lot of DGS fed in China, you see a lot of DDGS fed in Southeast Asia, because again, from a price per unit of, of nutrient, it's, it's really pretty cheap over there. So it, 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 it depends, right? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I, and I think too, that, uh, I don't believe that there's any swine operation in the Midwest that has not been utilizing DGS. Um, like Dr. Thaler said, it, it varies based on economics of the nutrient requirement. And, and there's, um, uh, with, with um, prices as corn and soybean meal, DDGS, and the craziness of the prices of, of lysine and amino acids and all those things, um, it's a constantly ev evolution or changing based on the economics. And then in some situations, even the availability right now of some of these things, it's getting difficult. So, so there's, uh, if you're not, if you're not constantly looking at the price of that protein or those amino acids, um, you're not doing, you're not doing your job because it's changing so often. You could be feeding one ration, like Dr. Fowler said, we change rations more than I care to, let's put it that way, because of the economics. But you're exactly right, Bob. I would say there are very few, if any, swine farms that aren't using some DDGS somewhere. And okay. thank you both. And um, with that same line, I'm actually Bob Hemisath. I'm going to throw this question at you that I have. But before I do that, I'm going to start um, launching out our poll so the participants can start helping us filling that in prior that we finish the Q&A session and before we say the goodbye statement. So please um, please help us in joining this poll. This is very important for us to improve our, our programs going forward. And um, okay, Bob, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue with you. And here it says, Mr. Hemisat, do you expect to use more DDGs this year due to the price of corn and soybean meal? No, that's a... Uh, um... Yes, probably. Depending, and it's still going to come back to the economics of it. You know, if um, 
Right now, we're, we are using less DGGs than we have in the past based on economics. We are actually starting to look at adding more back in because of the economics of it right now. So um, for me to go out a year and tell you I'm going to use more, I can't necessarily say that because of the, because of the craziness of the economics of it. Um, if, if we... Um, if we continue, one of the things that that we've noticed is is that um, at our local ethanol plant, sometimes availability is a little bit of a uh, a concern because they there is such a demand for it um, globally, used in swine rations and stuff like that. That sometimes there's an it's not a it's not like you, you're not going to get it, but sometimes there's a day or two where you're a little bit. Uh, because they're filling a barge or something like that to go overseas. That just shows me how much of a demand and how good of a product it is because there's so much demand for it. And I think, El Darrell, you can help me with this, but I thought I just saw something yesterday that U.S. Grains Council put out that there's a record record year of uh, DDG exports this last year. So, um, and that's all over the world. And, and that's a, so to me, there's, Get back to the original question. It, it, it's going to depend. I hate to not answer, but I just tell you that uh, two months from now, if I told you yes, two months from now, I might say no. But it, we're always looking at the opportunity to utilize more DDGS, and it all comes down to the economics. Yeah, definitely, Bob. Economics do change, commodities fluctuate quite a bit. So I guess uh, formulation changes quite a bit throughout the year. Now, we just got another question on our chat. Is DDG's formulated feeds cheaper compared to commercial feed? Um, that would be for any of, of all the, the speakers. Um, That's a tough one. <laughs> well, it, it, it's, um, well, DDG's formulated feed is commercially available. Right now, you know, we add DDGs to our formulations based on the cost of the product relative to that of phosphate, soybean meal, and corn. Um, it, it certainly does provide a price advantage most times, but there have been some situations where because of the price of the DDGs relative to the other products I just mentioned, it would not enter into the formula. So, but right now I can tell you, yes, it, it, um, it gives us a price advantage and it is in our commercial feeds right now. Perfect. Well, that same line, um, I received a question with about feeding DDGs and it goes, should I change the final carcass weight expected when using high inclusions of DDGs? No. no. Simple answer is no. And no whatever reason. you're, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, there's no reason to change anything as your of your marketing weight. Your marketing weight should be whatever your uh, the demand of your processor or harvesting facility wants. You adjust. You can adjust as we talked earlier. Um, if you if you think there's a concern, you can adjust your inclusion rate or take it out towards the end. But I, there's no reason to change anything from a weight standpoint. Okay. Yeah, and I just want to add to that. Um, when we're formulating our diets, it's to a specific nutrient requirement for the weight class and for the animal and the genetics. So whether you have 10% DDGs or you have 5% DDGs, the final nutrient specification of the diet will always stay the same. And what you do is you do a least cost formulation to a specification. So it's it's two constraints. It's not just, you don't formulate cheap feed like that. You, you tell the formulation software that by X amount of days, I expect to get this weight and you need to formulate what's the cheapest formula possible to get to this specified weight. And that's the reason why you should not expect any differences. And, and what you do is you pull on, if, if the formula um, calls for additional lysine to be added, it will do that. If it needs additional phosphorus, it will also do that. 
Um, so those are the things that, that we take into consideration. So the quality of the final product will always remain constant. It's going to meet the nutrient profile that has been specified. The only thing that will change is the, the, the percentage of the ingredients moving up and down based on price. Perfect. We go back to economics, huh? That's As a correct. species. Great. That's all right. Well, this would be our final question before um, we start doing the, um, the final statements for the, for the webinar. And it goes, and I would say probably for Bob Hemisath and Dr. Thaler for your, on your experience, but how has the carcass quality changed since you started using DDGs? Um, simple, uh, Dr. Thaler talked about it and you can go back. Um, there were some concerns early on with DDGs and the variability and the, and the higher oil contents of some, some carcass quality issues. Um, we are seeing now that the DDGs has become more consistent. Um, we don't see any issues at all anymore. There's if you if you're if you're doing things the way you should with your rations, um, we're not seeing any problems at all. We were going we were up thirty percent inclusion rate at one time, um, all the way through. We weren't even taking it out at the end, and we weren't even get and we weren't seeing any issues. Um, I take I take hogs out of our finishing facility and get them slaughtered at a local processor and the meat is absolutely perfect, I think, in my humble personal opinion. But it's uh, uh, definitely do not see any issues that way. And, 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 that, yeah. Yeah, and to go along with that, so you know, our systems are, are large enough now where they have very direct conversations with the packer and the packer has a very direct conversation with them. They know this load of pigs comes, comes from Bob's farm and they can track it. And if there's an issue with pork quality, Bob gets a telephone call really quick and saying, hey, something's wrong here, you need to change. And so uh, pork producers in the packing industry work really closely together because they both need to be successful. And so, yeah, I would say uh, once we understand how to feed it and we do know how to feed it, now we know how to get the, the target goal what the packer wants, uh, it's, it's not an issue. Um, guys, I'm going to shoot just another question before we actually finish the sessions. I'm starting to get more and more activity on our chat. And we're um, on overtime I, now. I know, I know, but just a couple of minutes, you know, we got to got to make sure everybody gets their question answered. So it goes like this. How much percentage of the usual feed buildup does the DDGs account for? I can, let me read. Could you restate that or reread that, please? Yeah, let me re reread it. How much percentage of the usual feed buildup does the DDGs account for? I would guess it's probably the amount of inclusion. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand what they mean by buildup, but um, yeah, inclusion as we as we talked about is anywhere from ten to thirty percent, I would say, um, and uh, as we, as we talked, it, and that. That's a general range that, that we've done on the farm in our rations for lots of years. Yep, when you, and when you looked, was it 2012, Bob, when corn prices were at $7? Yep. You know, uh, people were putting 60% DDGS in swine diets. Uh, mm -hmm. Did not affect growth performance. Uh, carcasses weren't great, but they were in a survival mode. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. Watch what the pigs tell you about. I think we're where most of our producers are comfortable at thirty percent, not causing an issue. Okay, great. Well, I think that's the end of our Q and A session. Uh, with that said, I want to thank you, Dr. Thaler, again for for being with us this morning, Dr. Bob Hamasath. Thank you as well for, for sharing. This is our first experience and it's great to always have a pork producer, farmer join us in this event so they can share their experiences. 
and definitely talk to Tanika and the high pro team and all that were involved from the Jamaica broilers. Thank you for having us, invited us, permitting us to develop this webinar for your customers in Jamaica. And um, with that said, I don't know, Tanika, if you would like to just share a couple of words and we finish, we let people go. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Alvaro. You know, this is a very important part of our outreach program on our, and our technical program, having valuable guests attend and, and just share their experience and knowledge. And just to show you how, how important this session is, um, Dr. Fala certainly taught a masterclass on the use of DDGs. You know, I, I started taking notes because this is something that we've been discussing back and forth. You know, I've, I've capped off the, the amount of DDGs I use in my formulas. I certainly don't go anything above 15%. Above, um, so it's, it's interesting that you can go all the way up to 30% without seeing the, the soft belly um, taking place. And, you know, I, I really appreciate the time that everyone took out of their busy schedule, especially our, our um, participants and the swine producers and general agriculturalists who just want to improve their, their knowledge of, of what is available out there in, in the, the wider arena. It, it is um, in a day and age where everything is happening virtually, there's a lot of demand on our time and just carving out a little portion of that time to, to come and sit with us and listen to the knowledge that has been imparted is, is certainly really appreciated. And at HyPro, we want to say that we're in this together. It's a partnership and it is in our best interest that you attain maximum profitability. And one of the ways in which we do that is by sharing information together. And that being said, you know, I, I'm just a telephone call away. A lot of pig farmers out there, they know that you, you can just call me up and share your concerns. I'll, I'll come out either myself or definitely Kalil will, will come out to your farms and observe and make notes. And if any adjustment need to be made, we'll definitely do that. And one of the ways in which we can do that is through the help of, of um, specialists provided by the US Greens Council. So we really want to, to thank everybody for participating. Well, thank you, Dr. Tanika, and uh, everybody that attended this webinar. It means a lot that you participated with us this morning. Thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Goodbye.